not all reformers accepted the amillennial view of Augustine and the Roman Catholic Church. Small militant apocalyptic factions caused considerable controversy and horror throughout Europe. Bloody excesses among a few millennial radical groups caused the major reformers to pull back from millennialism in stark horror. Millennialism differs from amillennialism in one very basic way. A millennialist believes in a literal future golden age or paradise on earth in which Christ will reign for 1,000 years prior to the final judgment. An amillennialist believes the opposite, that the millennial reign of Jesus Christ described in Revelation chapter 20 is allegorical of the present church age. This difference, simple as it may seem, is the crux of the bloody excesses found in these militant radicals. When the millennialists factored in the cosmic week theory of the early church and the three-age theory of Joachima Fiore, there could be no doubt they were living in the last days. They believed that they were living in the final moments of the second age, referred to by Joachim, and the third and final age of the Holy Spirit was arising in their midst, the golden age of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. What made these millennial radicals so controversial was their willingness to give God a helping hand and bring about the final golden age with radical social action. Let's take a look at these fringe millennial radicals. To understand the Hussite revolt of Bohemia, located in the Czech Republic of today, we must understand that one main issue inflamed the passions of the common populace of Bohemia. The extravagant wealth and corruption of the Catholic German clergy who grew fat on the suffering of the Slavic population. The avarice and greed that corrupted the clergy of Bohemia was a common complaint heard around Europe. The issue was especially true in England during the 14th century. A radical theological scholar by the name of John Wycliffe challenged the authority and validity of the Roman papacy to be the final arbiter in all secular and religious issues. John Wycliffe was one of the first reformists to accuse the Pope of being the Antichrist. Wycliffe was a national hero in England because he adamantly defended English rights against foreign papal encroachment. He openly rebuked the theological structure and the abuses in the church. The issues that troubled John Wycliffe about the Roman Catholic Church spread across to the region of Bohemia. The views of Wycliffe took deep root in this area of Central Europe and one of the main leaders of the Wycliffe movement was John Huss. Huss was a follower of Wycliffe and he was fiercely anti-papal, even labeling the Pope as the Antichrist. He became the recognized head of a national movement that emanated from the University of Prague. On July 6, 1415, the Papal Council of Constance found Huss guilty of heresy and burned him at the stake. The Roman Catholic Church thought that with the death of John Huss, the issue would subside. But this was not the case. Huss was more dangerous dead than alive. His followers, who became known as Hussites, were even more militant and radical than John Huss. One thing the Catholic Church did not realize is that John Huss was a restraining arm to the more radical elements in the Bohemian Revolt. 
With his death, the Hussites needed to define their loyalties. The Hussite movement splintered into two factions, with the conservative element refusing to break with Rome, while the millennial radicals that became known as Taborites demanded an absolute break with Rome and social revolution. Their name is derived from Mount Tabor in Israel where they believe Jesus foretold his second coming. The Taborites believed that nothing in religion could be true unless it was found in the Bible. They thought that their doctrine simplified the Christian experience by reducing all Catholic liturgy to greedy rhetoric. They especially rejected priestly ordination in favor of the new Reformation doctrine called the priesthood of all believers. Based on their understanding of Joachim's three-age theory, the Hussites predicted that the third golden age would arrive in February of 1420. This prediction caused chaos in Bohemia. Many Taborites sold their farms and possessions and fled to the Taborite towns of southern Bohemia, where they would be spared the final judgment on the Roman Antichrist. From their center, in an abandoned castle, the Taborites rapidly built the ruins into a fortified city named Tabor. The Taborites now settle into their new towns and villages to await the coming millennium. When the predicted date came and went, the millennium radicals of Mount Tabor did not crumble in confusion. Instead, they readjusted their doctrine to compensate for their disappointment. Taborite preachers refocused their millennium views to incorporate two advents of Jesus Christ. The first coming was a secret spiritual advent connected with the building of Mount Tabor, while the second coming of Jesus would be physical and would occur at a later date. The disappointment of February of 1420 only strengthened the resolve of the Taborites to hasten the coming end by forming armies to fight a holy war with Papal Rome and the Holy Roman Empire. These radicals saw themselves as the warriors of God. The Taborite armies spread radical reform throughout Central Europe during their warring expeditions. Rome initiated six crusades against the Hussites, but the vastly outnumbered rebels repulsed all these crusades. The Taborite movement prospered until the conservative arm of the Hussite movement united with the Roman Catholics and destroyed the Taborites at the Battle of Lipni on May 30th of 1434. So ended the millennium fever of the Taborites. When we thought that the Taborites were the radical extreme of the Hussites, another group earned the distinction of being the most extreme. That group is the Picards, also known as the Adamites. The Adamites took possession of an island in the river Nazarka and lived communally, practicing social and religious nudity. The Adamites believed that they had regained Adam's primal innocence. Therefore, they adopted Adam's name as their own. According to the historical record, this cult wore no clothes even during the winter months. They engaged in sexual promiscuity, prohibiting marriage and believing that all men possessed all women in common. They renounced all personal property rights and believed they could seize other people's possessions. 
the Adamites often conducted raiding assaults on neighboring villages, taking what they want and killing the villagers. The Adamites lived as if all prophecy had been fulfilled and the millennium, the third age of the Holy Spirit, had already begun. In fact, they believed that they had reached Christ's perfection and the innocence of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Adamites' bloody and vulgar behavior so enraged the sensibilities of the Hussite community that a Hussite army exterminated them in 1421. Another bloody example of millennium fever can be found in the Peasants' War of 1525. The peasants of Germany sought for economic reform from Charles V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. They wanted major changes in the old feudal order that held them bound to grievous social injustices. News of the Taborite Revolt in Bohemia spread to Germany, and the peasantry sought political reform from the emperor and papist Rome. The actions of Martin Luther spurred on the common folk of Germany to organize and demand even more change. But Luther was adamantly opposed to the violence and bloodshed inflicted by this social uprising. Initially, the Peasants' War was a localized struggle for social and political change. It was not a true millennium conflict similar to the Taborite movement. This would all change with the radical millennial rhetoric of Thomas Munster, who took advantage of the revolt to inflame total bloody social upheaval. Munster was not concerned with the peasants' grievances. He only wanted radical social revolution. He accomplished his goals by clothing the social issues of the peasants with an apocalyptic element. Thomas Munster was an educated, gifted orator that could enrage crowds with his apocalyptic rhetoric. Munster believed in a future millennium, but he insisted that the golden age of the millennium would only come through violent bloody war. Munster's bloody millennial rhetoric ended on May 15, 1525, at the Battle of Frankenhaus, with the total destruction of the peasant army and the execution of Munster. The peasant army marched to their destruction with confidence that their action would bring about the millennium. Munster's deadly rhetoric did not end with his death. It found fertile soil in the newly emergent Anabaptist movement.